Sir, what is your leadership philosophy and what were its major influences? Has it changed over time? How? Well, you know, it's, it's difficult to, uh, to self-analyze what your own leadership philosophy is. I would like to uh, think that mine was one of fairness, uh, honesty, and always working towards completing the mission. I had some great uh, influences in my life from the standpoint of my family, uh, had great parents. My father was a World War II vet, uh, officer, captain, combat engineer in France, repairing bridges after uh, Hitler blew him up. And um, my mom was a stay-at-home mom, so I had that, that uh, opportunity. But throughout my, uh, my training, whether it be in an ROTC or junior officer training, uh, always had people that were, were great mentors. And I always uh, went into that with the idea that they knew more than I did. And so what uh, I think anybody does when they try to put together what their philosophy is about leadership is to try to pick out the good points uh, from all of them and put them together with your personality as much as you possibly can. As far as whether it's changed or not, I, I think it would, uh, to think that your philosophy would stay static would, uh, would not be acceptable because things have changed so much in the time uh, that I spent in the, in the military from the standpoint that uh, the political correctness and the, uh, the fact that uh, the way people were treated was just a whole lot different. I mean, back in the days when, uh, you know, the when the earth was cooling and I got drafted, you know, people were uh, were treated a lot different than they are today. And so, uh, there's no way that leadership philosophy could stay the same uh, throughout the 37 years that I was involved with the military. So, I think you have to uh, you, you have to be uh, flexible. You know, we we used to say in the in the Air Force that uh, flexibility is the key to air power. And so uh, I think you have to do that with your management style as well. Now, sir, you've led both uh, military organizations and civilian organizations. Uh, what would you say would be uh, the, the most difference uh, as you transitioned over to leading a civil organization? Well, uh, it's a tremendous difference. And I really didn't know how much until I actually uh, got started with the civilian side of the house. It's one of the things that I think sometimes we take for granted is uh, the fundamentals that those of us in the military just accept. Um, mission oriented, you know, what is it going to take to get the mission done? Uh, you know, how many times have we heard stay in your lane? You know, make sure that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing and it's kind of it. More specialization. Exactly. And so what happens is that on the outside it's not like that. I mean, you have people that have little or no management training. Uh, you have people that don't have the same work ethic. You have people that don't have the same um, ability to comprehend and it's uh, it's just a whole lot different and I, I gotta be honest with you the military is so much easier because uh, people are all there wanting to pull on the rope in the same direction and the thing that's really important especially for the young people the young troops is that since 1974 everybody's raised their hand voluntarily sure. you know so it's not like that and a lot of times in the civilian world you have people that are that are thrust into jobs and you know they're there because somebody told them to be there and whether they're prepared for it, whether they really care one way or the other uh, is sometimes pretty evident and so uh, the military side has a great advantage from the standpoint of of uh, preparing for preparing people what they need to do for the job and then i think the other thing that we do a lot better job of in the military and there's times when people would debate this but i think we um, we tell people that they're doing a good job more than the civilian people do. Now, on the other side of that, when you, you know, when you do something wrong, we probably come down on the military people a little bit harder than they do on the civilian side. But I think the uh, the other piece of that is is that from basic training on, you're taught about the fact that you know your personal desires are not all that important. Now, granted, there's some people in leadership positions that think you know they do things based on what they want to do personally, and those people probably end up not being very effective leaders. But once you keep in mind what the mission is and what your capabilities are, and never, ever put your people in a position where they can fail. You know, you need to train them and you need to make sure that they're ready. And once that happens, then pull the trigger and press on. And it's just amazing to me how these young people today, uh, you know, it, it frustrates me so much when I hear people talk about the lost generation and about the fact that these people can't cut it. They're not as good as we were, you know, when we were coming up. 
Well, I got to tell you, that's not the case at all because the people that I see, the young people that I see in the military are heads and shoulders above people that I deal with in the same age group, the same peer group on the civilian side of the house. And so I think we're very fortunate from that standpoint. And to be honest with you, I think that's why I stayed in so many years. Well, that's, that's a great tie into the next question. Uh, as a leader, what do you think should be the ultimate goal, uh, whether it's to develop the individual or develop the organization, collective versus individual development? Absolutely. What, what I believe is that the mission comes first. And then what I would always try to do is that I would try to mentor or I would try to bring people to a level to where that mission, you know, try to pick people to do the right job and then try to get those people to go just a little bit farther from what their training was or to give them an opportunity. I was never one to say, okay, it's my way or the highway. You know, I just, I wouldn't do that. I would find out what the mission was and then the first thing I would do in, in just about every case, what do you think? You know, what are, what are your ideas about this? Not to just come up and say, okay, bam, bam, this is going to happen this way. This is the way we're going to do it. No questions. Get out of here. Let's go so do it. Would you say you're an advocate of a more decentralized decision making? Would you push that down to the lowest level or well, do you reserve some decisions as a, as a leader? Well, obviously you have to have some decisions that you have to make because you're the one that's going to be held responsible for it. But the, the way that I was taught, and this is something that I learned uh, very early on uh, from my father and also from, from just you know, organizations like Boy Scouts and, and, you know, civilian type of, if you don't have some ownership into this, you're not going to perform. You know, if you're, if somebody's just telling you, you're going to put widget one and widget two into this box and widget three and widget four into that box, and you say, well, they won't fit into that box. I don't care. Just put them in those boxes. People are not going to react to that. People will will perform to, to measures that you have no concept of if you give them the opportunity to do it. Now what you have to do is that you have to prepare them before you do that so that they know what the expectations are and you know where they're in their lane and when they're out of their lane from that standpoint. But I always thought that if uh, they had some input into what we were trying to do, even the fact that you're listening to them and you're giving them an opportunity, that's goodwill that you can't buy. You can't, you, there's no way that you can put that together. And so what I always wanted to do, and I think one of the things that was just driven into me was the fact that once you become a leader, it's not about you. You know, it's not about you looking good. It's not about you getting the credit. It's about the unit or it's about the mission being successful. Because th that, I think that's the biggest mistake that young leaders make is that they think, oh, if I'm going to be a captain or if I'm going to be a major or if I'm going to be a sergeant major or if I'm going to be whatever, whatever senior rank it happens to be, then, you know, I have to look good. And the fact of the matter is, now having been to those places, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. Right. It's not about who looks good. It's about were you part of a mission that was successful. So would you describe your, your leadership style as more servant leadership? Have you ever used that term? Well, you know, I think that there's a lot of different things that you could call it, but I think what it, what it is, is it's more, maybe it's leadership by committee, you know, from the standpoint that you want to get all the input that yeah. you can. Build consensus. Build consensus, make sure everybody's on the same page, and then press forward with it. Because one person, it doesn't matter who it is, at what level, you know, battalion, brigade, it doesn't, wing or, or squadron, it doesn't matter. Everybody doesn't have all the answers. And the truth of the matter is that you might get somebody that's down on the food chain there that just sees it with a different look. One of the things that's been very evident to me, and I think it's, a, it's been something that has made the military better, is the fact about diversity. I think the fact that we have females, we have people from different backgrounds, and we have people of different color, and they have grown up with different things and different thought processes than a good old white boy might have done. And so they see things and they see it from a different standpoint. And so one of the things when I was a commander was that I always wanted to make sure that we had some diversity involved with that, not because it made us look good about how many colored faces were on the, or how, what the different chromosomes were at the table, but the fact of the matter is that those people would have input. And all you got to do is just let them know that you care about what they think. You know, I used to, have a, I, I used to tell them all the time, you know, nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. 
And so what happens is that once you find out that they can put some input in, and if they say something and it's real stupid, you know, and you just go, hey, you know, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard, they'll never say anything else. Sure. But there's, def there's ways that you can do that. But by having that input, if we didn't have the need for all these people, we wouldn't have them. Absolutely. And so what happens is that you need to utilize those people, and the fact is it helps them to grow. It helps to mentor them so that we're, when they're sitting at the chair at the head of the table, they all know about making sure that other people have that input as well. Yes, sir. Well, I think you addressed the next question here without us even get to getting to it about your leadership style. Uh, you're definitely a more uh, the kind of leader that wants to build consensus and teams in order to achieve change. Um, next question, what do you think is the most uh, salient advantage and, uh, and largest disadvantage of your particular leadership style? If you could address any, do you, sure. do you critique no, no. yourself at all? Are you oh, self-critical? No, absolutely. Uh, the fact is that people will, you know, people can be perceived as being a weak leader. You know, if they're, if all they're doing is asking questions, you know, you have to go in uh, in that situation and you have to say, okay, this is what we're going to accomplish. Mm -hmm. You know, this is the mission. This is how we need to. This is what we need to get done. The question is, how are we going to get there? What's the best way to get there without resource, with the least number of resources? without putting anybody in harm's way. The important thing is everybody, at the end of the day, everybody goes back to their hooch or everybody goes back to their, their housing sure. and nobody gets hurt. That's what we want to do. Never leave anybody behind. Make sure that we've got people and they're safe. That's the, that's, that should be the foremost thing that a commander should think about. And so what happens is that sometimes, you know, I've had, I've had people say that to me. Well, don't you feel like maybe uh, you should have been more firm about that. Well, the, the, the final decision rests with, with the leader, and that's the person who's going to be held accountable. And so you can go up and you can take all that input in, but the final decision has got to be yours. And so at that point in time, that's when you find out who the real leader is. You can't have these people making those decisions, but the input is what's important so that you go and you make that last decision there, you have all the possibles. You've gone through every scenario about how we can make this happen. And so, you know, it's, we, it's over and all of a sudden, you know, it's, it's screwed up. It was a failure. And then somebody down here said, well, you know, we should have done this or we should have done that. Hindsight is 20-20. It gets perfect every time. You know, a long time ago, a, a superior officer uh, told me once uh, that a leader should never apologize because some might see that as a sign of weakness. When you make a mistake, uh, do you, would, would you take a responsibility to your subordinates or do you take your mistakes in private and, and develop yourself and, and drive on? I can't tell you how many times I've said I was wrong. And I don't think there's anything with saying that you're wrong. As long as you go into it with all the facts and the best information that you possibly have. Because the truth is, every one of us is imperfect. And so what happens is, what, that's what, another reason why you want to get consensus about all the people that are sitting around the table so that they, ha they can say, well, you know, this, have you thought about this? And one person can't think about everything. And I'm sure that you, you are the same way that I have. And I just, I just want to say something about something that you just said. You said a superior officer. There are no officers that are superior. They're senior. senior. And so the fact is that if you think of yourself as a superior officer, you've, you're lost. You've already gone down the wrong street. And so what happens is, in this particular case, is that you gather all that information, you get the best information that you possibly can. And the fact is, I've had situations where, you know, I say, well, you guys, you know, I just think this is not the right thing to do, and this is the way we're gonna do it. You know, because the fact is, you know, I might have information that they don't have, or I might know something that they don't know about that. See, I think that would be surprising to a lot of people that, you know, military organizations, as hierarchical as they are, uh, can be very egalitarian yep. and very respectful of the opinions of subordinates. Uh, that's very interesting, sir. Well, there's a lot of there's a lot of people, and you've seen them too, sure. that aren't like that. You it's, know, right. my way, highway. That's the way it's going to be. Civil organizations would be a lot more hierarchical and uh, authoritarian than a lot of military organizations. I think what the, the major thing that you have to put this all around are the expectations. You need, and I do that. I do this with church things now, and I do this with civilian. What are the expectations? This is what we need to get to. And so you need to know that this, and we eat this elephant a piece at a time. All right, we have a mission to do. It'd be just like we do an op order, frago, or a warning order. 
The right. fact is that we know there's pieces that we have to get together before we get the final thing done. So when you communicate your, uh, your vision uh, to your staff here at, uh, at, uh, at Parks, um, do you go into the same kind of detail as you would with the military order with things like your, your desired end state and, and uh, metrics how to get there? It's, the reason I'm, I'm smiling about that is because it's a, it's a learning experience. Um, of the staff that I have here, the 18 people that I have here on this staff, only two of us have served. Uh, my admin officer who was a sailor for 10 years and, and myself. And so uh, they don't have that military background. And just, uh, just to give you a real quick example, uh, when I got here, there was an H-23, an old uh, Korean helicopter, like the ones they used in MASH with the stretchers on the side. It's sitting, it was sitting down in the uh, Vietnam and Desert Storm area. So I walked through there and being an Air Force officer and knowing that aircraft and that kind of business, I, I looked at it and said, what in the world is this Korean helicopter doing in Vietnam and Desert Storm? And they said, well, that's the only place we had to, had to put it. You know, it's in the wrong era, we got to get rid of it. So one day, in, sitting in this room in a staff meeting, I uh, told them that I had purchased a Cobra helicopter and that we were going to put the Cobra helicopter down in Vietnam and Desert Storm because it was appropriate for both of those conflicts. And uh, I mean, immediately around the table, it'll never fit. How are you going to get it in here? The biggest door we have is seven foot wide. So there's no way we're going to get a Cobra helicopter. And so I said, we're going to take it apart. We're going to paint it. It was in chocolate chip from like we were in Desert Storm. And I wanted it in Vietnam color. So I got the Vietnam paint codes and we took it apart. We put it back to, you know, put it back together in and it's sitting down there. But the thing is that you have to give them something to reach for. And you have to give them something that sometimes is, they think is out of their reach. Sure. And you need to be pretty sure that you can get them to that point. People need to have goals. They need and no they one know when they're done. Exactly. Interesting. Okay, sir, uh, next question about the, uh, how you developed your leadership style. You've, you've served uh, as an officer for a long time. You've also served uh, here in a civil organization for, for uh, how long have you been in charge here, sir? Seven years. Seven years. Uh, so almost as long as uh, I've been on active duty. Uh, how, can, can you describe someone in your life uh, who's had a great impact on you, someone you see as an effective leader, and what particularly made them effective? Not necessarily someone uh, similar to your leadership style, but someone with a leadership style that you respected and then gleaned something of value from. Well, I think ultimately it would be my father. Uh, as I told you before, he was a combat engineer in World War II. And, uh, one of the things that he, he made sure that I was fully aware of was the relationship between officer and NCO and how important it was. And that because you're an officer doesn't mean you're better than an NCO. The truth of the matter is that you've got to have both of those functions to make the military work. And I can tell you that uh, that was something he beat into me and told me stories about what NCOs had done. In fact, uh, in France, he was involved in an accident where he fell into the river and a couple of NCOs pulled him out of the water. Uh, this was, you know, they were in the rear area, but it was still in wartime and it was a dangerous situation because he was uh, caught between two boats at night uh, on the Seine River. And so, you know, the fact that these two NCOs, you know, took care of him. He also told me about one night they were in a, uh, a uh, place that served adult beverages, for lack of a better term and uh, there was some, a fight going to break out between uh, some Army people and some Navy people and two of his NCOs picked him up and carried him out of there so that he wasn't involved with the fight. You know, and Dad sure. wanted to be there with his troops but they knew it was better for an officer not to be involved with this. So things like that, ne I never forgot them. And the truth of the matter is that I, I strongly believe that uh, your best bet as a leader is to surround yourself with the best people that you possibly can and then listen to them. And the fact is that uh, I have the utmost respect for all of the ranks, but especially the NCO Corps, because those are people that have gone through the, gone through the uh, ropes and they've been through the problems and, and they, uh, especially the NCOs that we see today. Absolutely. And I think that, uh, you know, the, the process to, to select an NCO now is very difficult. I think, and, and to be honest with you, when I see a Sergeant Major or I see a Chief Master Sergeant, I think a Colonel. 
I think of that person as the same level as being a colonel. You value their opinion. I the value level. their opinion greatly. I, all of the NCOs, I value their opinion. But by the time that a person becomes a, uh, a sergeant major or a, a chief, then I think that those are, are the greatest. And you notice that I didn't say E9 because there's a big difference between being an E9 and being a sergeant major. Absolutely. You know, and there are people out there that are E9s, and that's what they are. They're not sergeant majors. They're sure. just they're just E9s. But the fact is, they're, they're usually few and far between. But I, I honestly believe that an officer or any leader is going to need to make sure that their philosophy is based around, about respect. You've got to have respect for the people that you're, that you're leading. And to be honest with you, there's something that I, I must have said it a thousand times in my 37 years. And that is that you don't work for me, we work together. I honestly believe that nobody works for anybody. A good leader is going to have somebody that works with them, not for them. Sir, so you, you touched on something there, uh, you know, the officer enlisted relationship. Uh, I think maybe our civil counterparts might liken that to, you know, management labor relations. Uh, recently, there's been a lot of, of debate uh, about unionization and what that's going to mean in Indiana in the future. Uh, you know, I'm not uh, trying to pull out your opinion about recent legislation, uh, but what do you feel the major uh, roadblock is between improving the relationship with, with management and uh, union or, or labor uh, in the civil sector? Well, I think it's a lot different on the military side because obviously if we say we're going to take this hill, we need to go take that hill. It's not time to negotiate to do that. And, and the truth of the matter is that uh, my personal opinion, which is, is just that, is the fact that uh, I think things have changed a lot. A lot of the safety conditions and a lot, the unions have done some great things for this country. But we also now are in a time where people think differently. You know, they think about freedom and they think about, well, you know, the other thing that, uh, that gets me all the time is they think, well, these are the rights and the privileges that we receive while we are a union. And now they kind of turn their back on that and they say, well, I just, I don't want to have somebody tell me what to do. I want to be more, more open. I want to be, you know, whatever that case happens to be. And I, and I think the, the bottom line of all this is whichever, whether it's union or non-union, what's ever best for bringing jobs and to bring this country back to where it was is what we need to do. You know, we got 35, you know, depending on what reports you talk about, 35 to 45, 50 percent of the people in this country are are on welfare or on assistance. And the truth is, you know, it's like anything else. You have more people taken than you got putting in. You can only do that for so long. And then at some point in time, something's got to give. And so, you know, if this union piece is part of that, and, and the other thing is that I think, you know, what we would have to think about is that if this doesn't work out, you know, then we need to go back to the way it was. But the fact is that, you know, whatever it's best for this country is what we ought to be doing. Sure. Put, sir. Uh, sir, next question. How do you select the metrics to judge uh, your organization's success? For example, you're trying to achieve something particular, uh, put a new exhibit in, in your uh, museum here. Uh, how often do you do an azimuth check to check up on your progress? Well, the thing that drives that in today's world is money. Uh, and the fact is that if, you know it's nice to say, I'd like to have this, I'd like to have that, but whether the money works or not, uh, one of the things that I, I can tell you that my people get tired of hearing me say is that I, I don't need to drive a Cadillac, but I need to have a Chevy that will operate and start every day. And so what happens is that in this case, in, in running a 30,000 square foot museum, 24 acres of property, and a 3,000 square foot museum down on the circle, is that I have limited funds. And so what we need to do is that we need to make sure that we're judicious and how we spend the taxpayers' money. A lot of times, I don't think people think about the fact that it's your money you're spending. And so that's why, you know, right. they think I'm really tight with the money. And I make them account for, you know, just about every dollar that they spend. And it was the same way when I was on active duty in the Guard or in the Reserve. The fact is that that money, you know, all it is is numbers. But sure. the truth is, when you get right down to it, it's money. And the, the, the system, especially the military system, is not conducive to that because what happens is you either have money thrown at you and you've seen the same thing. You right. can't spend all the money it that they give you. It turns into a race to execute your budget. Yeah, so or you let, you've your got to spend everything year. that you got whether you need it or not. So at the end of the year, you're buying all the stuff that you don't really need just so you'll make sure you get that much money back the next time. You know, 
if you ran a business like that, you'd be, you'd be bankrupt in, in months. And so you just have to, I think you have to be very judicious about how you do that. But the part about checking your azimuth is critical. You know, just because you started in this direction doesn't mean you're going to have to finish in that direction. And so what you have to do is you have to take into the capabilities of your staff. You have to make sure the money is there to do what you need to do. And then sometimes you just have to change direction or you have to say, okay, this is where we thought we were going, but right now this is where we have to go. I've got that situation going on down in the Revolutionary War right now. We're getting ready to redo that room. And I don't want to do it until we have everything done so we can do the whole room at one time. I don't want to just do part of it and then do the 18, War of 1812 or the Mexican War or that kind of business You know, up until that point. We can't do that because we have 200,000 people that come through here a year and I don't want them tripping over stuff being in a construction zone and all that time. So you know, those are the kind of things that you have to do that. On the military side, you know, sometimes you don't have a lot of time to think about that. You know, you got to say, okay, you've got a target of opportunity here. This is where they're going to be in the next 24 hours. This is where we're, you know, we'd rather do this at night. We, we do better. We fight better at night or we, we surveil at night better. And sometimes you have to do that. But the fact is, if you're locked into, well, this is how we planned it. This is how we're going to do it. Sometimes that's not going to work. Sure. Sir, you touched a little bit about uh, ethics and being a good steward of the taxpayers' resources. Uh, this, this question here sort of addresses that. Do you think a leader should consider more, more about ethics and social responsibility when making decisions than, than the bottom line, which I guess would be uh, money, profit, or whatever your incentive is? I think that the smartest thing with that is that you have to make decisions based on the fact that somebody has a camera in front of you and is asking you, why did you do that? And to be honest with you, it comes down the bottom line every time is the golden rule. If you treat people the way you want to be treated and it's something that you can stand up and you don't you can look yourself in the mirror and say, you know, I made this decision. It was the right thing to do. Somebody, you know, maybe it was hurt somebody's feelings or maybe somebody didn't get promoted or maybe somebody was discharged. Sure. Or the you know, there's a lot of hard decisions you have to make as a commander. But if it was the right thing to do for the individual, because it's not about individuals, it's about the organization. Mm -hmm. And so what we need to do is that we need to make sure that we're making decisions so that the organization will be successful. In line with that, we need to take care of our people to the maximum that we can. On the other side of that, if you do something really bad, if you do something that's not recoverable, then you have to stand up and you have to take you know, responsibility for that action. So, sir, would you say uh, for a nonprofit or, or governmental agency that ethics and social responsibility are more important than a, in the private for-profit sector because there's some assumption that, that we're not here for out of self-interest, there's an assumption at play here that this is an altruistic kind of organization for the benefit of the community? I don't agree with that. I, I think that whatever you're doing, whether it's military, whether it's civilian, it's got to be something that you believe in and that you know in your heart that you're doing the right thing. There's never a wrong time to make the right decision. And so what happens is that if you're making the right decision every time, that ethics business and all that other stuff will come right in line. Unless you're just a psychopath and you're, you know, probably shouldn't have been in a leadership position in the first place. But if you're making, if you're, if you're trained and you, you know, have, a, have an open heart and an open mind, and that you're listening to these people and you're taking all of this information in, even though the decision is difficult sometimes, sometimes you have to pull the trigger and you have to execute. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, I would say 90% of the time, whether it's right or whether it's wrong, is something that you know will pop into your head. You know you it. You know it based on your values or your, you know. The, just the way, that, the way you live. So you, you kind of touched on something, it's, it's not one of the questions here, but uh, in terms of developing uh, leaders within your organization, uh, any kind of organization, uh, obviously some folks are attracted to positions of leadership out of less than altruistic motives. You know, maybe folks are attracted to positions of power because, uh, you know, they're trying to glorify themselves or just achieve more power because that's, that's who they are. Um, how do you how do you weed those people out, and how do you how do you identify uh, a good leader uh, or the potential for good leadership early on in someone's career? Well, I think uh, I can tell you what I have seen, and I, I believe this to be true, 
is that by the time a person is a captain, uh, and to be a major is, is probably the most critical rank because somebody has taken a look at this person and they said, you know, they have potential to be a leader and you hear about the iron majors and you hear about the sure. tough jobs that they get. Don't get much glory of out of it. Exactly. So that tends to weed out some of the folks yeah. that... And so by the time then you're a lieutenant colonel, you know, if, you be, if, if an, you're in the, in the military for 20 years and you achieve the rank of lieutenant colonel, there's no one in the world that couldn't call that a success. And so, you know, there's a lot of times, though, that that's where, where it ends because they're not ready to take that next step to colonel or to a general officer. Absolutely. But the jobs that you have and the performance that you have is so critical, so critical. The captains, you know, captains, uh, I always thought captain was the greatest rank because, you know, the, you're not right. a lieutenant anymore, but the fact is you're starting to do stuff that's, uh, you have more responsibility, some stuff that's more fun and that you can, uh, that you can relate to. You know, being a major, uh, you know, is probably the hardest from the standpoint of you're given opportunities of whether you're going to be successful or, or not. And I can tell you, having been through all those steps, that uh, we've taken a look at a lot of majors that, you know, hey, they're ready to go or, hey, you know, they've, uh, they've peaked out. That, that, that's interesting. And, it, you know, when you look at the, the private sector, uh, a lot of organizations are flattening out and they're losing those kinds of middle management positions. Uh, so you're seeing folks getting... Uh, thrust into those leadership kind of roles without any kind of real managerial experience. Exactly. And you see, you see a lot of those kind of organizations going through some growing pains, you know, putting, promoting folks that maybe shouldn't have been put in leadership roles. Yeah. And, you know, because of the turnover is so, so fast these days, you know, uh, average uh, career uh, worker works about like three to four years per position. Exactly. Hmm. So in your mind, what, what kind of leader uh, can be called a successful leader? Uh, this is more of a subjective, in your opinion, question. Uh, what makes a leader successful? And uh, are there things beyond numbers that uh, uh, you value more so in, in terms of defining your success? Well, um, I think one of the things is that if you're known as somebody who's going to get the mission done, if you're, you know, one of the greatest compliments I ever received was uh, from a two-star general that told me, you know, anytime I give you a job, I know it's going to be done. You know, and if, if I don't know what, what the expectations are, I make sure that I know them before I leave his office. Or soon after, if I decide, you know, if I figure out, well, you know, this, is, this could go a couple different ways, which way, you know, what, what is the final outcome? I just want to make sure I'm really clear about this. And so I think the success piece is not always about numbers. It's not about how many widgets you made or how many, you know, how many troops you recruited or whatever the case happens to be. What about the quality and the fact is, you know, were you teaching people, were you mentoring people as you went through this? And uh, I think those are the things that you judge success about. And if the reputation that you have, you know, the fact is, and you've seen it yourself, there's, cer there's a certain group of people that always get the hard jobs. And because they know that the commander or the or the general or the sergeant major, whatever the case happens to be, know that they're performers and that they're gonna they're gonna do the job and they're gonna get it done. Now, is that fair? Maybe not. But the fact is, you know, sometimes you don't have time to be fair. You just have to get things done. And I can tell you that people who accept that responsibility and want those jobs to get you know to get them accomplished. That's what it's all about. To be, sure. you know, that's where that's where the fire comes for me is to make sure that my team or my group or my wing or whatever the case happens to be that they had an opportunity to be successful. And the fact is, I want them to have the credit. All I want to do is to be part of what they were done, what they were doing. To me, that's where I get the most the most fun out of all of this sure. is the fact that they are successful. Well, that's interesting. You touched on you know some leaders being uh, preoccupied with fairness. Uh, rather than just mission accomplishment, uh, do you see that as a, a negative trend? Or is that you know, something I that's think, always been around? Yeah, I, I think it's something that's been around. I think that uh, if you see in one of your subordinate leaders that they're they're of that mind, then you know you might try to mentor them. You might try to say, you know, have you thought about looking at it this way? But the bottom line is, as you go up and, and there's fewer and fewer slots, um, those people just don't get selected. Last thing I want to say, don't worry about getting your next promotion. Do your job and the next promotion will come. Yes, sir. Sounds good. 
Well, sir, that's all the questions we have for you today. We really appreciate you uh, doing this for our, our project here. And uh, if you don't mind us putting it on the internet to share with the world, I think a lot of other people will, will uh, appreciate uh, the lessons you shared with them today. So. Well, it was an honor to do it, and I, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity. Thanks, sir.